So, um, welcome Thomas. Thank you so much and thank you so much for this opportunity to be on your beautiful piece of land that you're stewarding here and to put a capstone on, on these couple of days that we've had together to think this through, all of mm. these conversations and, and uh, really bring them to something, something concrete. I'm really looking forward to that conversation. Great. So maybe tell me and people listening a little bit about yourself. How did, mm -hmm. did you get into this? What's, what's your story? Ooh, my personal story. Yeah. Um, like it, particularly with when did mm. it start that you felt like there is something that goes beyond the personal story with regard to the Thomas Schindler story, mm -hmm. but the Thomas Schindler in service to something larger than himself? Mm -hmm. Well, that specific thing, I think it would, I would say, well, it's ever since I can remember. We had dinner table conversations around existential threats um, with my family, basically as a everyday activity, mm -hmm. and about how we can mitigate those with natural sciences. Sciences, and and at the same time, I was my dream was to be a rock star, and and so that tension um, created me. But that that that. Um, task basically that my um, parents put into this our this package of our socialization mm -hmm. never left. Mm -hmm. So that's and my my job in life to contribute was seeded there. This is your father being a biophysicist. Yeah, um, correct. Working on what was he working on? The, I ion that? channels actually. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Yeah. So how do how do cells? Um, communicate with their environment and with each other mm -hmm. and, um, and and these kinds of questions uh, that was that was what we were talking about and power microscopy and and, uh, mm -hmm. and how to how to use power microscopy to do things that it wasn't intended for and and then um, yeah, I can still smell uh, the lab um, mm -hmm. uh, and very particular smell yeah actually. very very particular smell and, and what, how did that Thomas turn into the tech entrepreneur uh, startup guy. Well, just by chance, I stumbled mm -hmm. into that. Um, um, as I wanted to, after having studied social work, where I thought I would contribute, mm -hmm. I decided that's not for me. I'm, I'm perpetuating the game. I'm perpetuating the system by be doing social work. I'm going to be unhappy. It's not. It's not what I what we need to do. I, I. I wanted to go back to music. Mm -hmm. And in that, I also discovered the internet, and that captivated me so much more. Mm. And I started building platforms just because I could, and I could see that with an idea, with a computer, and with an internet connection, I could start solving a problem for many people. Mm. And that was deeply inspiring, captivating, and. Um, I could also observe, and <laughs> never really do it for myself, but I could observe that people were making large sum of sums of money with that kind of activity. Mm -hmm. And my um, hope was, maybe I can do that too, and then send it in the right direction, because what's, what was absolutely clear was that money was always flowing in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. and, and then in the course of, those, of that journey of building software and mm. software companies and for for profits at the time mostly to to help solve some things i i had a had a deep um first understanding of the first principles of how we do things as a civilization in a meeting with um two high finance guys mm. the head of the central bank of germany and the former head of the central bank in of, of belgium Bernard Bernard yeah, yeah. And um, and they wanted to come up with a new currency somewhere in Germany, and I, my head blew up because I really couldn't understand how two high finance dudes could come up with a new currency, some out of thin air. Mm -hmm. And then I learned from Bernard that all money comes from thin air, and that the that the design of the currency of how you create it from thin air is a crucial element in how we. Structure whether society. how we do society yeah. and, and whether whether that has a positive or a negative effect in the world yeah. and um, 
then I understood, okay, this, this, this natural science thinking, the first principles of how we do things, actually makes sense also in this space. Mm -hmm. Trying to really understand the root causes and then try to maybe come up with some ways of, think, of changing those root causes. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, so was a natural progression from the tech into systemic thinking or thinking about systems and, 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 and how, to, how to somehow nudge systems or do things with systems that they start being more life-serving. Mm. Then you started to share the experience that you built doing that in collaboration with others in sort of incubator programs. Am I right with that? Or? Well, um, well, I did many, many uh, mm. things. I, I built uh, a lot of um, companies and initiatives to the end of trying to change those those uh, um, root cause uh, root root cause elements. Um, but I was never really one hundred percent happy with what I was doing, simply because I didn't know whether it was had any useful effect in the world. Mm -hmm. So I decided one day that um, I was, I was um, too embarrassed to, to, to continue to talk about um, helping make the world a better place um, without actually knowing what I'm talking about. Right? And that um, started me on a journey that um, led me through a much more precise learning and, and, and uh, encounters like mm -hmm. our um, uh, uh, encounter mm -hmm. is, is, a, is, a, is a continuation of that but that um, helped me articulate what I actually think it should look like mm -hmm. while understanding and acknowledging that this can only be a dream, a hope, a horizon, something not something that that can be Articulated in its in its depths in its in its nuances, um, because not any single person can claim to know, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, but it's a it, to give me directionality, to give me um, to give my my intent and the, the intent of everybody I work with mm -hmm. a, a directionality. That was extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And part of this learning, like I, I always like the way that when you want to learn something for yourself, you create a multiplying platform that allows other people to learn as well. Like mm -hmm. the, the early steps of the Gita initiative that you're working mm -hmm. with, um, creating this Gita series mm -hmm. um, where you yeah. Nate Hagens and Kate Rayworth and mm -hmm. a bunch of people um, were reflecting their kind of entry point into this understanding the nested complexity we're having to deal with and, and each one of them it sort of built a kind of kaleidoscopic um, approximation to yeah. what we're working with from yeah. different perspectives. Yeah, and I, um, I'd like to go into Gita later and into mm -hmm. it, but I think um, what I would, would love to try here mm -hmm. is to, to open a kaleidoscope uh, between us Mm -hmm. um, in a way, so um, I would I would like to unpack a little um, how I how my how my dream of the future might look mm -hmm. like, and then I would I would love to contrast that with mm -hmm. with your dream of the future and see mm -hmm. what 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 emerges out of that, and mm -hmm. then maybe go into the more concrete mm -hmm. elements of that, which sure. one of which might be Gita at, at a later point. So if we make it. Yeah, through the rocky three decades ahead. No. Um, what does the world look like? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> Why is <that? laughs> And and there's a very very. Um, I want to ground this in the Stockdale paradox, which states um, based on real life experience by um, Jim Stockdale who was the highest ranking US prisoner of war in the North Vietnam prison camp for eight years that those who made it through those eight years with him were able to hold both an extremely hopeful radically hopeful long-term vision and a ruthlessly realistic short-term perspective mm -hmm. at the same time and um, 
So I cannot talk about the really hopeful uh, without talking about um, my ruthless analysis of the current moment. And I would mm -hmm. say the ruthless analysis of the current moment would lead me to real devastation on this planet within two, the next 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, famine, war, uh, people, enormous migration, enormous amounts of death and pain are at the current trajectory the, the most probable outcome, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And um, and I want to, I don't want to go into the depths of the why and how, but I want to want to move further into into the hopeful. Mm -hmm. And to do that, I want to want to anchor it in the in the current, which um, starts with understanding the multipolar trap we're in. Mm -hmm. I like to equivocate that with um, what uh, Bio Akumolafe likes to um, share. This this. The, the ant mill, the, the fact that ants some follow their pheromones into the death spiral. Into the death spiral, right? They, they, they use pheromones to organize society and then mm -hmm. sometimes they follow their own pheromone trail into a spiral of death and mm -hmm. they walk into in circles until they die of exhaustion. And when I look at our current modality of civilization, I think we're doing something very similar. Mm -hmm. But our our spiral of death it looks a little bit different and it, it begins with the fact that we're creating money exponentially the total sum of money is doubling every 10 years we're backing this with our own productivity which we call GDP and that's doubling every 20 years and ultimately GDP is the counting of atoms how many atoms can you move through a given economy in a certain amount of time and moving of atoms requires energy so energy demand is also doubling every 30 years currently 19 terawatt and from different biophysical perspectives you can say that there's limitation on how we can grow this in the in the, in the future right? we're not going to double this in the next 30 years um, regardless of how we look at this and um, and that whole thing um, despite Every, many people knowing that this is an extractive or an obligation for extraction and, and, and uh, um, negative emergencies, um, it's held in place by both politics and, and, and the economy, measuring their short-term success by GDP growth. Mm -hmm. right? so, and this locks everybody into this trap. And if we zoom out a little and, and, and ask ourselves, what if GDP is at the center? We all know that's wrong. So. What should be put at the center? And I cannot see anything but life at the center. Mm -hmm. And if you put life at the center, and the next question to ask is, what energy has life been using uh, for the last couple of billion years on this planet to do itself, right? Mm -hmm. To do life? And of course the answer is the big fusion reactor in the sky, mm -hmm. sending us 172,000 terawatts for free and constantly. That's 10,000 times the amount we need. Roughly 1,000 times the amount we need, 20,000, are actually usable for us. To turn, and that's the economic part, the six atoms that make up 96% of all life continuously recycling from the dinosaur you once were to you now to the flower you're going to be. Genops. Yeah, yeah. Carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Correct. And into the material stack for a successful civilization, mm -hmm. in tune with nature. And for free. Right? That stack needs to be for free, just like we, we, nobody can own this plant here. Right? Mm -hmm. We can have the imagination if we own it, but we, we don't mm -hmm. really own anything living. And, um, and what would that mean for our modalities of governance? Mm -hmm. Our modalities of governance are highly coupled with the resource, the control of a resource in a, in a given um, society. So the more, the easier it is to control, the more likely you're in, a, in an authoritarian, yeah. authoritarian state. And the, the power over system rather than the power with system. Correct. So now what would happen if, if material generation would be dis evenly distributed to everybody on the planet and nobody had to worry about where to get their materials from? No resource control. What would that mean for governance? Mm -hmm. And then what would that mean for modalities of exchange? Do we really need scarce money based on our own productivity and modalities of transaction? 
Or can we actually do something like a relational gift economy? Right? And if you, if you look at the um, economy as a, as a modality of, um, of information organization, right? Um, uh, um, and I <laughs> want to um, quote Tyson here. Um, Tyson Luca Porta uh, in, in a conversation once once said in his very unique way about the invisible hand of the market. Well, what if it's not a hand? <laughs> what if it's a cock, right? And so that that hand or cock or whatever other um, body part that might be needs information to know what it needs to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, and. So if, this, if it's an information system, you can look at it from a perspective of bitrate. How much information can you pass through the system in a second? And if you do that calculation for a money-based economy uh, with transactions and relate that to a gift-based economy with, in relation, then you will see that that gift-based economy of relation has a higher bitrate, much higher, twice as high, actually. So it might be the superior system, gifts. So that whole thing, because I mean that's that's one of the things I learned from um, Bernard. Mm -hmm. uh, um, previous cur currency systems, of which there existed many, because mm. money was much more localized, mm. um, used to very often include something called demurrage, mm -hmm. which actually incentivized you to keep the money in circulation mm -hmm. because the money actually became worthless if mm -hmm. you just hoarded it. Yeah, right? yeah, and the gift economy also invites you, like everybody's abundance rises through sharing. Mm -hmm. So you, it incentivizes positive interaction. No, actually, okay? the, but yeah. the but but the fiat money economy mm -hmm. based on interest hoarding and all of that, mm -hmm. and it stops the circulation to a certain extent because people hold on to the money. I mean, that's a whole kind of worm that you're opening mm -hmm. there, but. The Inuit term for wealth actually is having enough to share. Mm. I think that's super powerful. And the demurrage or negative interest rate is mm. basically mimicking nature and money. Mm -hmm. right? Everything will die at one point. And, mm. and if your money doesn't die, your design of your money is wrong. Mm. But we can even go further. And as you invoke Bernard, um, Bernard used to tell this, uh, share this, this beautiful story that he experienced in the city of Ghent in Belgium, where um, there was a section of the city that had um, was populated by undocumented immigrants. Mm. And um, like so often in, in, in those situations, because they do, cannot have real jobs or, or, or official jobs, there's a downward spiral of substance abuse, violence, poverty, all of that. Mm. And they, the government didn't know how to solve it. So what what's, um, they, um, they, they called Bernard. Bernard went in and asked them, asked the people, what do you dream of? What would you like? And, and what, he, what he learned from them is, we want to have a piece of land to grow something. And so as he, he got a piece of land from the city, he invented it token, a currency, to, um, that you could earn by doing things that made your environment more beautiful and more nice to live in, and then through that token you could rent that piece of land. Mm -hmm. So your dream actually made your real lived reality more beautiful mm -hmm. just by implementing this. And so Bernard's dream was to have a central bank of dreams. Right? So, let's say you deposit your dream of life in that central bank and I do something in the world uh, that makes this dream more likely, better, bigger. So you just mint a Daniel token. You give me some, right? I just got some Daniel token. It's a, but I cannot go out buy bread for that Daniel token. It's a, a token of appreciation. Right? Because there are only so many Daniel tokens around, nobody will accept them for payment, but nobody has to. Because if we all set out to fulfill each other's dreams, there's a high probability that apart from maybe cleaning your toilet, everything else is done, will be done by gifting each other things. So that was his, his big dream. And I, 
um, until I stumbled into the idea of material generation through natural processes. Mm. I couldn't see how that would be possible, but now I can. Mm. Now I can see how that could actually be possible. But mm. I just, I just said your dream. What's? I would, I would be, I would be curious. What would be your dream that you would put into Bernard's central bank? <laughs> I'm already living my dream. You're living your dream? Yeah. I, I don't like... For me personally, I don't feel like I need to add much. Uh, but yeah. um, the kind of pattern of organization of humankind fitting back into the nested wholeness that we're part of and emerge from, mm -hmm. the bioregional re-inhabitation of the planet. Mm -hmm. um, a lot where what the heliogenic idea is summarizing for me is, mm -hmm. is very akin to that patterning of mm -hmm. um, re-regionalizing production and consumption, mm -hmm. um, creating a bio-resource based economy that is grown in place mm -hmm. um, for most of the things that mm -hmm. we do. Mm -hmm. um, we probably need a relatively long period of transition to um, enable those fully regional, regenerative, solar-driven circular economies mm -hmm. to actually be there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think there's some necessary transition phase there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that enables people to again create cultures that aren't owners of place, where mm -hmm. there's no um, this is my land, but mm -hmm. where we share territories, regions in a commons with all mm -hmm. of life. And um, the oversight is, do we treat the land in such a way that it becomes more abundant, more biodiverse, mm -hmm. more bioproductive, um, and basically take the role that we've had in the past as a species. We, all over the world made ecosystems more abundant and more bioproductive in our species history but then in the last 15,000 years stopped doing so and um, increasingly became um, a degenerative impact on the planet but I think we can reverse that if we do this shift towards a much more regionalized way of mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. But we need to not lose, like if we go back into some sort of parochial regionalism, mm -hmm. that's also not working. We need to keep that global solidarity and global exchange to support people to predominantly be, be local going. And, mm -hmm. and that's sort of the dream I'm working on, but not with regard to trying to create large global networks, mm -hmm. but actually building the, the hard practice in place. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in one place where I live. I'm mm -hmm. working with people on the regeneration of the Balearic Archipelago in Mallorca mm -hmm. um, in connection with other people doing their bit elsewhere mm -hmm. and um, finding also the balance between the what can we learn from each other and mm -hmm. what is ultimately so 100% specific that it simply cannot be transferred and that it actually has to be invented as we go along in the context of a specific culture and a specific bioregion. The, the, the more I do it, the more I question the transferability of most things, because mm -hmm. uh, it's, the devil is in the detail, uh, mm -hmm. and in the human relationship building, and in the narrative shifting, and, and that's, yeah, that's, that's what I think is the, the necessary shift. But it's very linked to, at the higher level of all, everything that you're doing, mm -hmm. is just simply building the scaffolding for this to be more possible. Well, I think I think there are multiple angles to build scaffolding. Mm -hmm. um, my perspective is on the materiality of things. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm hearing in yours the the cultural binding of the specificity of the necessities of the of this of place mm -hmm. um, is is a, is a really important element. And I think that's that's very very hard to to get into. Uh, uh, um, it's harder for me, at least, uh, to to think about how to how to do it, do the 
cultural fabric mm. of, a, of a place and how do I heal that so that it actually is in tune with mm. the needs and wants of all life in there. Mm. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm really curious to, uh, two questions really. Mm. Um, one, we might address a, a little later, which is your, your lived experience of that here. But the other is, if you if you if you zoom out a little, um, maybe on the on the on on a, on a similar level, a very abstract heliogenic civilization, mm. these few elements. How do you see this panning out on a on a global level? Because you you said we need to be somehow in global conversation, mm -hmm. at the same time, grounded in place and local culture. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you see this um, playing in, I mean, in the big picture? In large scale, that's a political question. Mm -hmm. I think it's um, the political ideal that is at the core of the European constitution is a concept called subsidiarity, mm -hmm. um, which is basically saying that any higher structure of governance should take a subsidiary role to enable the people in place to make the decision that affect them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is almost the opposite of how we run governments at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if we now moving towards a world which is the world that you were describing with the sort of dark future option mm. in which supply line disruption through war, environmental disaster, um, economic co conflicts, um, accidents like a boat in the Suez Canal mm -hmm. um, is just increasingly more likely. Mm -hmm. um, therefore we beginning to see that the globalized system of production and consumption that is incredibly resource inefficient and energy inefficient is actually also really highly risky mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i already see with some of the corporates i've had conversations with that um, compared to the 90s if you in the 90s is or in the noughties if you talked about decentralized manufacturing it's like no no let's just all move it to asia and mm -hmm. pay the chinese to the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm production. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we're kind of set there with all the big factories being in, in, in China and mm -hmm. um, starting to think maybe that wasn't such a good idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So for me the, the necessary political changes that we um, build the enabling um, political scaffolding that we actually have a subsidiary system and that mm -hmm. needs a lot of work of enabling community-led initiatives in landscapes, in mm -hmm. particular at a particular scale and that's also where mm -hmm. the urban and rural divide healing could come in when we define our cities within the context of the bioregions that they're nested in and all the urban development is actually mainly driven in a, through a process of reconnecting the ruralities with mm -hmm. the urban environment and what i believe is that that will need a very nuanced look at technologies with mm -hmm. regard to which technologies do we use at what scale and which are really the platform technologies that allow the kind of chon or chonox based mm -hmm. material cycling um, mm -hmm. and some of it is through very simple ancient just grow it in place and some of it is a bit more techy mm -hmm. uh, is grow it in a test tube and that's mm -hmm. where the dodgy area starts of mm -hmm. there are some technologies that I don't think we should use, mm -hmm. like transgenics, to create materials. Mm -hmm. But um, manipulating the production of enzymes that mm -hmm. cut and paste mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. molecules together that have no capability of self-replication, uh, self mm -hmm. um, sort of synthetic biology, mm -hmm. uh, is something that is probably part of that material future. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, there's, it's basically all of this somehow has to fit into each other. There's a mm -hmm. material science aspect, mm -hmm. there's a scale linking design aspect from product mm -hmm. design to architecture to urban mm -hmm. planning, to bioregional planning. That's mm -hmm. the, the, the scale linking theory is what I developed in my PhD in 2006 or, or built on. It's actually mm -hmm. older, like Stuart Cohen and um, Sint van der Rim wrote a book in 1996 called Ecological Design, where mm. this is where the first time I came across this notion that we haven't paid enough attention how every design we do needs to be looked at on all scales mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, the impact that has. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so it's technological innovation and relocalization, it's political innovation and enabling structures, it's watching out that in this, oh, we should do it that way, mm -hmm. we don't fall into the trap we always fall, which is that we, we overswing the pendulum. We mm -hmm. like, first it's all globalizations and it's all localizations. First it's all tech, then it's no, 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 no tech. And where do we find the, the middle thing? Like, and so you, you actually have the right type of international trade that enables the relocalization um, and all, all of that is, is, is massive work. <laughs> and, 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 a, and a binding of the risks that are inherent to this as you, as you pointed out with some of the um, tech or basically almost all of the tech um, could be a function of the culture, it could be bound by culture. Only um, if it's at the right scale, like mm -hmm, the, the, the yeah. thing, I mean that's the precautionary principle. If we created a scalar boundary around our experimentation with certain technolo technologies, you, mm. depending on some of them, we should just not experiment with mm. because they can escape too easily. But um, at a local and regional scale, the feedback loops of non-regenerative action are much, much faster than if you create systems where production is in one place and reassembly is in another place and marketing mm -hmm. in the next. Then you can hide all the negative externalities mm -hmm. really quickly. But if you mainly do it in a local place, they're, 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 you live mm -hmm. in the middle of mm -hmm. your negative externalities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in the context of all of that, mm -hmm. um, I'm extremely curious about how that actually happens in place. Right? The, the cultural... That's why I wanted to ask you about Gita. <laughs> <laughs> you start. But, but um, for me, um, Gita is, is not so much to do with place. Um, I think it's more to do with tech. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't mean Gita, I mean, mother, I mean motherland. I mean motherland, the work that you yes. do in Africa. Yeah, motherland, um, exactly. Because right. there's some interesting like I remember you saying one thing that is, is an insight that I came to when I worked with business clusters here on, on the island of Mallorca, mm. that um, the whole startup scene and investing in startups mm. um, in certain environments isn't enough because mm -hmm. you, in certain contexts, need to actually innovate an entire system. Mm -hmm rather than just a business idea. Mm -hmm. So for, the, for that business to be successful, there need to be another six or seven businesses mm -hmm. that also need to do their work, mm -hmm. and then they can all be successful. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had understood was something mm -hmm. that you really learned um, in, uh, in Africa and your experience as well. In, 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 in Motherland. And yeah. In, so yeah, in Motherland. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> yeah maybe, maybe, maybe I'll start a little bit with this, with this story, yeah. but I'd like to focus more on, 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 the, on the actual learnings in the, in the here and now and what's happening. But um, we, were, we were interested in, in how can we help uh, or how can, can local rural communities um, be empowered in whatever way within themselves from, with help from outside to become um, Self-sufficient, self-reliant, um, but in a in a in a, in a very high standard way, not um, uh, not in, not in a, in a subsistence kind of way, but but um, in, a, in a really good life perspective. We did a two-year learning journey all over Africa to understand. We chose Africa because um, the the need in Africa is just so much higher than in uh, Europe or any part of the Western or North Atlantic world. Um, and so we went there, learned and understood that through a very tech lens in the beginning, uh, very mm -hmm. startups and how can we do this with tech, mm -hmm. uh, we learned that um, the, the, the answer is essentially in the soil mm -hmm. and, um, and very specifically in the post-harvest value chain um, mm -hmm. because that's where the big losses are for any, any smallholder farmer in, in, in Africa and most of the farmers in Africa mm -hmm. are smallholder. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
And so, just to give you another example, sweet potato um, in Kenya, Isiaya, we lose 60% of sweet potatoes post-harvest. Mm -hmm. 60% right? because, because they don't get to market mm -hmm. because they are harvested with um, a suboptimal technique uh, so they so they rot more quickly or dry more quickly mm -hmm. and depending on the variety you you can either store them for a longer time or not mm -hmm. um, and if you can't then um, they will either rot or never find a market because the market fluctuates uh, enormously uh, and you don't have access to storage in the first place. You don't have access to refinement. So, so that's it's, it's pretty very. It's actually very simple. Mm. So, um, we then um, also recognize that um, there's not a, not a um, first of all, not a one fits all solution, right? Mm. Um, this has to be appropriate to the community that is doing this because the crops are different, the culture is different, the, the, the climatic situation is different, everything is different. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it can also not be solved by singular interventions. Mm -hmm. So we set out to what we now call ecosystems orchestration, to bring in, to, to, to understand what's, what's the issue and we focused in on sweet potatoes as a, as, a, as a first crop to really understand what's happening there and then bring in startups and local actors that can help solve parts of that. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, there's now a, um, you, can, you can call it an ERP system for rural Africa that um, we can not only help the farmers uh, keep track of their own produce, how much do they actually produce, but also understand the market better. And suddenly they, they, it becomes evident to them that they should be um, evening out the market because um, as, as they all produce sweet potatoes at the same time, obviously the price drops um, and then they, they, they cannot sell their sweet potatoes anymore. Um, there would be um, subsidizing them if they mm -hmm. even if they sold them and so they have to store them for a while until the price goes up again right and how, how do you how do you how do you solve that mm -hmm. we then with other partners found very low-tech ways to store them right it's actually one once you once you understand the biophysics of a sweet potato you, mm -hmm. you know that you have to um, keep it in high humidity and high temperature for a couple of days and then you keep them in low humidity, low temperature up to three months, which solves that problem. Mm. Or you can, um, which uh, um, is happening now, introduce through another, yet another party that we, that we, that we brought in um, to uh, um, produce chia seeds. And the beauty about chia seeds is that they only grow on healthy soil. So we had we we can now through that also start introducing regenerative agriculture practices, which also could be highlighted during the sweet potato phase, because we uh, there was one farmer who had pra been practicing regenerative ag for seven years, and he was the only one not hit by a pest. Everybody else was, and so so the the value of that now can be transported through the fact that we have woven them together much much more mm -hmm. so in effect what we can now show i mean in in august 24 that's when we can really really show the numbers mm -hmm. but we're pretty confident that we can show that with a hundred euro input per community member over the course of two years we can triple the income of the farmers make that community more self-sufficient and self-reliant get them on that path introduce regenerative agriculture and make that whole operation self self-sufficient mm -hmm. and then the idea is because uh, motherland operates as a non-profit mm -hmm. to um, model this as something that can be replicated in other communities until the point where this becomes such an obvious choice for any community mm -hmm. that they start copying it mm -hmm. so we can start stop existing you know what the one thing that listening to that that, that the sort of Biomimetic 
background knowledge mm. <laughs> makes me question a little bit is mm. I from an entrepreneurial aspect I understand that you need to start somewhere and mm. starting with one crop or mm. a couple of crops is mm. one way of doing mm. that mm. Um, but how do you ensure in a system like that that you then don't actually support a sort of main cash crop monocultural type activity rather than yeah. create a much more complex system uh -huh. that is much more diverse in production and then therefore boost the real resilience and, and um, fragi yeah. anti-fragility yeah. of the system. Really important question. Yeah. Um, and that I think is one of the key learnings um, over the last two years. So I was talking about how can you, the different varieties of sweet potatoes can be stored at different lengths mm -hmm. and have different, actually also serve different markets and different needs. Mm -hmm. Some are easier to turn into flour, some are easier to, 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 to use directly. Um, 2,000 varieties of potatoes in Peru. Yeah, and, 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 and sweet potatoes, I don't know, in, in just in that area where we're dealing with, I don't know, around 20 varieties. Mm. And so, um, and the, the, the industrialized market thing would now be, okay, let's focus on the one that has the longest shelf life mm. so that we can even out the fluctuations of the market and everybody now do this thing, mm. right? That would be exactly uh, creating that issue that, that, mm. you, that you were just, just describing. Right? Mm. And, and, and so instead, what, what, we, what we found, for example, was there was this one person who was really, really successful in su selling sweet potatoes. Mm. And he was using WhatsApp um, to communicate in his area. And everybody knew he's the sweet potato guy. Mm. And so if you needed sweet potatoes, you would ask him. And, and he could deal with all of the variety. Mm. Right? And so um, through learning from him and trying to replicate him, so that the project was becoming a Kevin, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because his name was Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how, do we, how do we understand what he does? How can, can that be replicated in a, in a different region by a different person mm -hmm. and then thereby allowing that multitude of crops actually reaching some, mm -hmm. some market, mm -hmm. right? In, and, and what that also does is it um, detaches from the national and, and international value chains, mm. right? Suddenly you become much more local mm. and you're, you're actually much, much more connected with, with, with your market. Mm. So that's, but that's... So is the market for them mainly local and regional or is it international supermarkets buying up? Oh, it's, it's, it's mostly national. Mm -hmm. But, but now through that, we're shifting it slowly through to, to, a, to a regional, more regional. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. okay. um, I mean, the, the portion of the, of the harvest they actually sold was national. Mm -hmm. The portion of the harvest, there's, there's another portion of the harvest that they use for themselves mm -hmm. right? in, 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 a, in a subsistence um, mm -hmm. way. Right? But, um, but that's, that's, that's the kind of shift and that's, it's, it's a slow moving process, mm. right? In addition, we do things with the kids in, in that community um, running a program we call the Young Earth Guardians um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the kids in, mm. in, in schools to um, establish an understanding of regenerative agriculture mm. for them. And so they can take that home and, and ask, so why aren't we doing that? And, mm. and, and things like that, right? So, um, it's it's a it's a long long process, mm. long very long. I mean, mm. um, we've been we've been at it in concrete terms for one and a half years in Siaya now, with uh, around three thousand people. Mm -hmm. right? um, so yeah, but um, I mean, as I say this, I don't know how many people live on this island. Mm. Coming up to a million. So that's um, a different beast. Changes right? changes enormously. Um, if you ask that question in August, it's two and a half million. <laughs> if you ask it in December, yeah. it's eight hundred and ninety thousand. Yeah, but 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 that's a different beast, right? Mm, um, very and I'm, I'm, beast. I'm 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 wondering how how does something like weaving an ecosystem happen on on a place of that size? Can it actually be at a million or? Does it have to be in, in smaller cells or 
or how, what's 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 your what's your learnings from from weaving here on the island for a long time? Well, just by comparing the approaches of different friends in different parts of the world, mm -hmm. trying to do similar things, which mm -hmm. is how, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows. Yeah. Um, we've kind of moved on from the bioregionalism um, mm -hmm. bit because um, mm -hmm. my, my mentor and friend Satish Kumar always says. In every ism, there's a schism. <laughs> um, it just invites an opposing perspective, mm -hmm. and it make, makes it sound a bit cultish. Mm -hmm. So, um, what we're kind of all uh, referring to is now bioregioning. Okay. How, how do we? How do we? Which is the weaving as, as well. Yeah. Uh, so, how, how do we? How do we do the weaving so the bioregioning becomes easier? Uh, mm -hmm. And um, they're very, very different approaches in the world. There's, there's a very male kind of more northern american more impact pack and quick way to funding mm -hmm. approach which mm -hmm. is a sort of we are gonna regenerate this entire alti plateau or mm -hmm. 200,000 hectares mm -hmm. or like a big big promise big mm -hmm. website mm -hmm. big we mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. when you then scratch the surface mm -hmm. can be one person mm -hmm. and some real doers on the ground mm -hmm. or it can be a small group of 15 mm -hmm. 20 people with a big vision, mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. and and I think there's some places where that just doesn't work, mm -hmm. where it would backfire hugely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think where I live, yep, uh, where, I, where I live, that, mm -hmm. that is um, one of those places. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. as you've noticed, I have a, a tendency when it's on camera to evade um, talking about definitely talking about what is daniel's work on mallorca because yeah. i don't think it is daniel's work um no and, but your experience and, you have an experience yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's not that you're changing the island but you have um you have an experience of of the um, bioregional weaving here i mean it's a very unique situation as every place would be a very unique situation and um the layers of cultural of history mm -hmm. of this place, of um, an island in the Mediterranean that has been invaded multiple times over the last few thousand years mm -hmm. by the Romans and the Saracens and the occupation of the, of the, the, the um, Al-Andalus um, Moorish Empire. And it, it does make for a, a people that are by default trusting to foreigners, mm -hmm. uh, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, cultural mechanisms of preserving your culture, even when for a while you're occupied by the next wave of whoever's there. Mm -hmm. and, and then the, the wave of tourism, you could say, is another form of mm -hmm. that. And the mm -hmm. wave of wealthy people coming and buying up land on Mallorca and uh, on some level on that scale, uh, scale I'm part of that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I bought the property here and I live here now. So there's a lot of culture sensitivity and then there's the identity of Mallorca and Catalonia in respect to the central state, centralized state of Spain um, and the history of the dictatorship that hasn't been really dealt with. So there's still all trauma and wounds that are also playing into all of this, which means that it's it's really complicated here, mm -hmm. and, and that's why I don't think that the that the, the, the deeper conversation there are lots of technological changes that mm -hmm. need to happen, and I, it's not an either or. Some in certain contexts, uh, agricultural led or technologically led conversation about how do we re-regionalize a particular industry could actually maybe be an easier conversation because you have less players and it's more specific. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to integrate at a regional scale, at the bioregional scale, you have to look at the kind of patterns of identity on the island mm -hmm. and across the islands. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I think you need to make people fall in love with their place again. And you need mm -hmm. to invite people into a dialogue that um, sees the diversity of people and opinions that we have as a natural, another natural source of creativity okay. rather than a reason for conflict. Mm -hmm. And so um, my, and it's an experimental theory of change, uh, is that 
what I call regenerative cultures has very often been misunderstood by other people as some form of future utopia, mm -hmm. some form of that's what we need to create mm -hmm. at some point in the future if we're lucky and we make it. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe I miscommunicated or maybe also my own thinking has moved on since I wrote my book. And it's much more f powerful to begin with what is actually already there. Mm -hmm. um, I like to call it the embers of a fire that just needs oxygen. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. like, and that's every act of caring, sharing, healing, nurturing, protecting, mm -hmm. celebrating identity, uniqueness. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. And it happens on, in all levels of society, mm -hmm. from helping teenagers that have come, come in conflict with the law to find a way back into society, to um, protecting the black vulture and bringing them back from mm -hmm. extinction, or mm -hmm. to um, preserving Mallorcan arts and crafts. Um, and what I think is first and foremost needed is to make people aware and appreciate that Regeneration is something that is inherent to life. It's happening in every cell of your body right now. It's happening like we, we regenerated over the last three months, mm -hmm. what we call I. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. And so how do we make people fall in love with each other and with this place again by seeing that we all have a role to play, that we all have an essential part in this healing to play mm -hmm. and that it's actually already happening and that, mm -hmm. and that what we need to do is to bring people together in a way of coordinating mm -hmm. and, and telling a narrative that that it makes them actually feel like they're doing something even more bigger than what they're passionate about mm -hmm. because they're seeing that I take my stance here with mm -hmm. the single mums mm -hmm. and he takes his stance with black vultures but ultimately we're all improving the to the relational fabric of this territory through our actions. And that's mm -hmm. what they call regenerative cultures. And, mm -hmm. and that's what Mallorca is full of. And, and so, so part of my new strategy is to, to create a way for people to see each other more and, and to create the, the, the local alliances beginning to start now with through, through the work of a friend of mine um, who have been helping to conceptualize this, we, we brought together um, various NGOs that work both in marine protection and environmental um, on-land protection mm -hmm. and in regenerative and organic agriculture. And just to begin, to, so they begin to see each other, mm -hmm. so they begin to appreciate that um, they actually all have a role to play in the mm -hmm. system. And so they begin to see that some of the things that they're doing would actually be more powerful if they did them together and told a narrative of how all of this fits together. And it's, so mm. we're working on a narrative of a drop of water falling on Masanea and then traveling down to Sabu the mm -hmm. and, and all the different um, cottage industries and, mm -hmm. and agricultural practices it touches as it mm -hmm. travels down mm -hmm. the Tramontan into the sea. And then we begin to highlight the intervention points along that route through different regenerative practices and new opportunities to create um, value-added local business and strengthen the local economy and, and all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a beginning, it's a thin end of the wedge. It's mm -hmm. still very NGO heavy, but I mm -hmm. would like to start a parallel process with the kind of ethical and social and ecological enterprises of the mm -hmm. island. Mm -hmm. um, and that probably would go more into the technological and product mm -hmm. innovation side. Mm -hmm. um, but we're beginning to also get more international support behind this. And mm -hmm. so um, it's a very slow process and there's no yeah, guarantees yeah. Of, we, <laughs> of, of success. Uh, so so, so uh, effectively it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach in trying to activate and integrate all of the different actors and perspectives on what it means to live in this place, to live together, to um, 
start working together to start mutual appreciation and support around the understanding of the interconnectedness through that, through that um, image of the of the drop of water which mm -hmm. um, is, is a beautiful image I think because it's it's my, my the first word my daughter ever said was agua mm -hmm. um, and it's it's so symbolic for life mm -hmm. um, so so I think that um, that's is a, is a beautiful binding element for this um, and it and it's the once that story is told you can in that story tell the really big story that is so central to the island mm. that I that is my great passion and conviction mm. <laughs> which is if we don't we'll, we're in a unique situation in these islands because we're in the middle of the Mediterranean mm. and climate change is going to increase because of global warming mm. Um, the amount of evaporation of the Mediterranean, which means that humidity will go up in this area, and it already is in the summers. Um, and the big difference for us, like the, the question of our future, is really um, can we regreen these islands and reheal the local hydrological cycle mm -hmm. quick enough with enough biomass, so not just ground cover of shrubs, but actually mm -hmm. trees, mm -hmm. to um, bring back the moisture that is generated by the vegetation mm -hmm. which actually is the deciding factor whether the moisture generated out at sea mm -hmm. rains off at sea or rains off on the land because mm -hmm. if you have a dry piece of land after 11 o'clock in the morning you, you've created thermal updraft mm -hmm. and there's like a column of hot air rising which stops moisture to actually be able to rain mm -hmm. on the land it mm -hmm. rains rains out at sea and you mm -hmm. see it in the in the damp Mm -hmm. season very often that it, it's not raining but out at sea you see these mm -hmm. rain dumps eh? and so um, the, the water drop story is one part of a cycle mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. um, and, and, and how that cycle plays out is actually a question of life or death on this on this, on yeah. this island and, so. and, and on planet earth I mean we've, yeah, we've course, but, yeah. taken half of the forests of the planet away yeah. and we degraded most pretty much all of the grasslands mm -hmm. and, and if we heal both of them plus the, the wetland systems then we actually have, have a chance of um, restoring the hydrological cycle which is a much more holistic way of approaching the climate change response than the carbon counting carbon myopic approach but, but learning how to dance this multi-pronged dance towards a bigger dream and 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 but bound in the reality mm. i think that's at the core of what's needed and also at the core of what we've been mm. uh, um, discussing the last the last couple of days mm. right um and and the way and i, I just talked about motherland but um uh, it that's 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 one of 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 my ways to do to, to the, to the multi-pronged approach mm -hmm. towards this bigger picture. Right? Um, I remember like when we had visitors the other day, mm -hmm. um, you, you explained in a very short way mm -hmm. um, the kind of heliocentric mm -hmm. civilization and the four sub-projects underneath mm -hmm. and how they kind of connect to each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, tell me again. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's right. So, so as a reminder, sun, uh, life is at the center, driven by sunlight, uh, material uh, being created through the natural processes based on the, on the six atoms of life. And the questions are, what can we actually do that? What, is that? what does that mean for governance? What does that mean for modalities of exchange? How do we live together? All of these things mm. that you're working on here in, in the reality of this, of this place. And with, with Motherland, we're trying to address the way we integrate that into a, into a coherent system. This is why it's so interesting to, 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 to contrast that with what, what you're doing here, because it's also a living ecosystem, people, nature, or <laughs> nature, nature, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and um, how that can actually self-heal over time. So that's that's what we try to do with motherland and 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 create these cells that can they can do this for themselves and then grow out from there. Mm -hmm. With um, the initiative for the regenerative market economy um, focused on Germany at the moment, mm -hmm. um, branching a little bit into Switzerland, 
Um, we're doing several things towards trying to um, help open the, the space of governance and how we do economy um, in, in the, in the, here now, in the, in, the, in the way we do this at the moment, through science and communications, that's one part, uh, mm -hmm. uh, push, putting out information and ideas around how could we do this differently. And then very specifically running a campaign we call the new Wohlstand campaign. Wohlstand mm -hmm. is the German term for wealth. Mm -hmm. And it's too often equivocated with money mm -hmm. in the public political discourse. And we instead in the individual private conversation, we know that wealth is not really money. It's much, much, much more. It's actually closer to well-being because role is to be well. And yeah. Stunt is kind of the, the state of affairs. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But, but well-being then also is, is in itself mm. very, very multi-perspectival, kaleidoscopic. Yeah. It, mm. it has, has to do with yourself, with your community, with your interconnectedness, with all of these things. Yeah. So, so um, and we believe that it could be a good thing that the, the, the people of the country come together as the sovereign that they actually are, um, it even written in the constitution of Germany, mm -hmm. um, to describe what they believe is, is, is actual wealth, right? Um, mm -hmm. In terms of what does a good life look like? Mm -hmm. So we're running this campaign in, across all cinemas in, in Germany this, this summer to bring people into a conversation around what does that mean and then ending in a citizens assembly that defines this so that the chancellor and the vice chancellor uh, can be presented with the results um, mm -hmm. in terms of the sovereign has spoken mm -hmm. this is what we want you can stop arguing where to go in the political arena you can now start Implement arguing our will. Yeah. how we get there yeah. right and, and ultimately, this is uh, the, the dream of this is to institutionalize something that has been in, uh, implemented in Wales 2015 in the form of the Future Generation Wellbeing Act, where mm -hmm. the Welsh people tell themselves, we want to be, see Wales in this and that way, in a specific way in 50 years, and then have a independent commission that can have veto any political dis dis decision um, that's not aligned with that goal, yeah. right? And that, that's a powerful way of yes. liberating the political arena from their short-term optimization it's one of the cycle. most interesting policy innovations of the last 100%, decade. yes, I yeah. agree. And so, so that's what we do with the, with the initiative for the regenerative market economy. And um, we're beginning to also um, help industry um, think about their, their material inputs. Um, you were you were pointing towards the, the six continent supply chain and how brittle that is earlier, with uh, uh, some ship uh, um, creating creating uh, a blockage in in the global supply chain, um, and it's so easy to to break that. So generating materials locally, which is at the core of the heliogenic civilization vision, and it, which um, is at the core of how nature produces things, and is 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 tapping the, the into yeah nature. yeah is yeah. tapping into the most successful economy ever on this planet, which is nature, right? Mm -hmm. More than human nature. Well, so we don't. <laughs> yeah, we, all of nature, yeah, yeah. Oh, including us, yeah. right? Um, uh, and so tapping into that, and and how can we generate materials locally? in tune with everything mm -hmm. so that your organization organization actually becomes regenerative mm -hmm. by default definition mm -hmm. and the way we do this is by um utilizing a, a piece of infrastructure that we will, that we also use for two other projects that we'll get into in a moment um which has indexed five million impact startups all over the planet and that has a large language model on top that we can used to identify the fitting solutions for a specific challenge. Mm -hmm. So if you need a specific set of materials for building your car and the, regula the regulator tells you you need to be circular by 2030, which is happening in, mm -hmm. in, in Germany, then we can build that pipeline. Mm -hmm. And we, we're, we're offering this as a non-profit product because GITA, uh, IRM, just like GITA and Motherland, are non-profit organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, 
which directly leads me to Gita, which um, with which we try to orchestrate Global Impact Tech Alliance. Thank you, Global Impact Tech Alliance. Yeah. We try to to orchestrate the people that are trying to use tech for something meaningful, which um, threw back at us for in the, in the beginning the question what actually is tech and and mm. what should it do and is it actually good that it does what it does and mm. all of these questions leading up to um the the gita master series that you were part of mm. um last year right mm. so last year and uh, which is now culminating in a um, book that um, summarizes all of the uh, perspectives that were presented and and offered by um, uh, you and your colleagues in that series mm -hmm. and what that led us into was the understanding that um, half of the population roughly of the planet lives in cities mm -hmm. and so we need to do something about cities too and it so it just so happens that one of your colleagues in the in the master series is um, Kate Rayworth who came up with the donuts. I made the connection. You made the connection <laughs> correct and um, and, you don't, uh, and, and, uh, and Kate has been approached by many, many cities um, with the question, how, to, how can we get into the donut? Mm -hmm. right? And if you don't know the donut, um, it's this circle that um, you want to be inside of, because if you're not, then the, the, the outside, um, uh, um, towards the outside, it shows how much you're overreaching the planetary boundaries. And if you're, if you're, if it grows red towards the center, you're not serving your population. So, mm -hmm. so it's a very, very clear visual guide of where you stand. So helping with the same product that we use for IRM uh, cities to um, basically move into the donut, um, fixing infrastructural gaps, like just as a, as a very concrete example, city uh, cities need streets, right? Mm -hmm. So streets are very, very much fossil. Um, fossil fuel bound and mm -hmm. um, you need you need tar at the moment that's what we think but we actually don't mm -hmm. because we found this startup in Norway that can do streets without um, without fossil mm -hmm. without carbon mm -hmm. and just with which they're doing in California and Australia as well yeah so so yeah. There, there, there are multiple solutions putting biochar into the Biochar, or you can you can use bio or geopolymers to, mm. to bind loose materials mm. in order to build a road, right? Mm. And and also, by the way, other building materials. Mm. So that's that's what we that's what we focus on with Gita, um, also non-profit. And then finally, we do um, what we call Project Miracle. Mm -hmm. Project Miracle is a response to the Manhattan Project, which is uh, the source of the situation of mutually short destruction by coming up with the nuclear bomb and that uh, forces us into this situation of mutual short destruction. And we're asking ourselves, can we, can we somehow provoke a, a, a thing that could move us all into a situation of mutual short thriving? Mm. And the way we think about this is that um, between 300 million and 1.5 billion people will lose their homes in the next 30 or so years and the question is how can how can we help them get new homes not shelters homes right not refugee camps homes and the response again is heliogenic tech to grow the materials they need to build their homes and therefore we're now creating the small pre-seed fund to fund early stage solutions towards building homes construction mm -hmm. materials but the ultimate goal of this, and this is this is um, further out, like ten years out, is that we work with large pools of liberated money. Liberated money being money that doesn't have to return itself or profits, mm -hmm. um, like pension funds, like the sovereign wealth funds, to execute something we would call exit to planet, meaning buying life-serving solutions out of the market, releasing them from the market pressure. Mm -hmm. the, the, the competition that ultimately leads to downward spirals and rivalrous dynamics and, and extraction and gifting them into the comets. Mm -hmm. That's what we would like to, s to help create in the world mm -hmm. um, so that um, we, can, we can distribute these life-serving 
solutions um, to everywhere where they might be needed. So that's the that's the multipolar stack to a multipolar challenge that that we're trying to to implement. And how far along are you with that project miracle? So we're we currently have found so far five companies that fit our thesis um, and we're becoming progressively better at finding them through the optimization of, of that of that stack that I was referring to with IRM which you also be using Gita and Project Miracle um, because once that model starts learning it mm. can get more refined um, so we, we have five we will go into fundraising once we have ten mm. Um, but um, through conversations, mm. we already um, have commitments of 30% mm. of the fund, mm -hmm. um, soft commitments, um, mm. no, no money in any account, but, but, um, but we're not worried about, about, the, about the funds, we're, mm. we're more worried about finding the real fitting solutions. Mm. Uh, see, this is it's fascinating, because on the one hand I can see so much admirably realistic and step-by-step -step approach in mm. what you and, and your co-conspirators mm -hmm. are do doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this other slight energy that, that it's, it's sort of my my dogmatic um, regen regeneration lingo training that that might or might not serve but this this whole it's still approach of we're trying to find the tech solutions mm -hmm. And then, what? Like it's still like this. What we've talked about a lot that that um, what might be a solution in one place might not be a solution in another place. Um, mm -hmm. And how it, it literally, like when you think of it in this heliogenic civilization way, it's it's maybe it, these solutions are all specific mm -hmm. to be what I would in the earlier conversation call like the the, the technological platform that enables the local production for local consumption and uh -huh. um, uh -huh. it, it still has this sort of element of uh -huh. we're going to create those 10 solutions and they will solve everything first of all you're completely right it, it it sounds like that it smells like that and it could actually if we don't if you aren't careful it could end up like that mm -hmm. um but that's not our intention and uh, we are trying to be as aware as we can on avoiding that. Mm -hmm. If I could dream the whole thing up mm -hmm. completely free and then attach that at the end and say, okay, this is actually what we're doing right now, our tactical steps towards this dream, mm -hmm. then it would look something like, well, we, we humanity, U.S. on behalf of the humanity spent in today's money 34 billion U.S. dollars on the Manhattan Project mm -hmm. because they were scared that Hitler would be faster with the development of the nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. And so, if we if we then say, okay, how does the current threat um, relate to Hitler? I think it's magnitudes larger. So the appropriate response is, and also needs to be magnitudes larger. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to say, okay, let's let's address this with 500 billion or something. Mm -hmm. And and that's, it sounds like a large sum, but in but some contexts it's, no. it's completely not a large sum, right? And especially not if you look at the, the cost of climate change, it's, it's a, it's a well, as we, small sum. As, as, as we've kind of quipped, but not quipped over the last couple of days more than once that we're in this bizarre situation in human history that the music is playing and if the music stops playing and you've still got money in your hand, you've lost. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, right. 500 billion is nothing. Is, is, yeah. is nothing because it's just, it's just bound potential and unless you activate that potential before a bend or break moment to use Nate and Daniel Schmachtenberger language, mm. then, then you're, yeah, you've done it wrong. So, okay, 500 billion. What do, would we do with those? Well, first of all, we would do the um, 
the, the foundational exercise of understanding the, the most primal kinds of material stream generation ways, like mm -hmm. what kinds of enzymes, what kinds of source materials, how, how does the whole all work and do the science and engineering for that. But then the actual work only begins then, which is building and, and getting into relationship with local organizations everywhere right um, I don't know 10 per country at least right to, that, that, that can be the representatives of what is needed in, in, in that in, in that set of bioregions what what works what doesn't work um, and and so that there, there, that there's a, there can be a a, a bridge uh, of, of um, knowledge towards the science and engineering in, in, in both ways and also tapping into the existing indigenous knowing of that place because many 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 of the solutions are already had already been solved before we've forgotten about them right and um, through modalities of colonialization like tourism or others right? so, so so uncovering these um, having that conversation, <coughs> bringing the appropriate solutions, adapting the solutions to the specific needs on the ground, that's the actual challenge. But um, I don't see anybody unleashing 500 billion for such a project at this point. Right? Um, so our, our tactical um, series of steps towards having that conversation the realistic conversation of doing that is what I, what I laid out first fund those solutions that might be part of um, that stack help them help them grow but then help them exit the planet so they become part of that pool mm -hmm. and at that point the work needs to transform into the conversation how do we adapt that to be appropriate to bioregion. Well, I mean, that's where I could see what you're working on and what the networks that I'm involved with in bioregional development are working on could begin converging at that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, in the sense that those local organizations that can give you local feedback actually, I think, already need to be very developed local networks of actors. Mm -hmm. um, that are cross-sectoral, yeah. um, not just the NGOs and not just the business people and not just the local government, but mm -hmm. representatives of all of them somehow mm -hmm. already having this conversation, already ha having created the will, the, 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 the higher vision, the narrative that mm -hmm. says, yes, mm -hmm. um, globalization did some things for us, but it mm -hmm. created a lot of collateral damage mm -hmm. and it created a really brittle planet. and. Mm -hmm. This re-regionalization isn't some hippies EF Schumacher mm -hmm. dream, but mm -hmm. actually Schumacher was right. Like small is beautiful, small is fitting to um, the patterns of how nature organizes things. Mm -hmm. And so um, we, we, I think all those technological solutions need to fall on, into fertile ground, both politically and Completely. culturally and socially. And, yes. and that work for me is is is, is really the, the sort of deeper narrative work in, in each place. Absolutely, you know? and um, I, I once was part of a conversation around um, also the same question. How do we solve things with deep tech? Right? Mm -hmm. And um, luckily that was organized um, as a, as a fishbowl and I was the one organizing it. Mm -hmm. And the, the audience very quickly showed us that they were not at all interested in, in our conversation around how do we solve this with tech mm -hmm. and funnily there was this conversation that emerged about um there's feminine tech that's needed mm -hmm. um and and i i i shifted the the topic actually of, of that of that uh, fishbowl because mm -hmm. i wanted to learn about what, what 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 do you mean what's 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 feminine tech and there was an extremely valuable takeaway from this mm -hmm. and that i that i um communicate usually as the difference between masculine scaling and, and feminine scaling. Where masculine scaling is, I have a solution and I now stuff the entire planet into my solution. And that's then 
something like Facebook, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, feminine scaling is more like, mm, I have a solution that works for me here in my place. Here's how it works. Here's the process. Try if you can do it too. And, and that makes sense in your place. It may, yeah. doesn't make like, sense, yeah. and then yeah. how how to adapt it, mm -hmm. right? Adapt it, um, and so so I think that's um, that's actually um, as it comes out of this conversation around what is feminine tech, it also ties very much into um, the, the 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 power of the the, the feminine energy as I see it at least as, as, as my wife taught it to me mm. um, of of creating life of nurturing mm. life right mm. and and um, that, that it's interesting because that's in many ways the core of the living the questions thing that I repeat so ad nauseum in designing regenerative cultures yeah. and it's the reason why that that epistemological Aikido of not summarizing each chapter mm -hmm. with a bunch of and now we've learned these solutions mm -hmm. are the right ones but i flipped it and formulated them as questions which mm -hmm. is, is in many ways like yeah. they're, they're loaded questions that uh -huh. are suggesting something yeah. but because they're questions they're cognitively landing in a different way they're not yeah. saying here yeah, you should really be doing this yeah. it's like you're just saying have you thought of this and do you think that might be useful after, after exactly all. so exactly it's, yeah yeah which is actually how my wife also communicates with me, and it <laughs> sometimes drives me nuts. Yeah, there's so, so, so much to learn, and yeah. we've, we've, we've forgotten so much about exactly that kind of balance. Mm. And um, I think we're not doing ourselves a favor by um, creating a world in which we um, ask the women to take over the roles of the men. Mm. That doesn't make any sense to me, but rather re establish a balance between what is the actual power of the feminine mm. with what's the actual power of the masculine mm. right and and to and the doing mode and the solving mode and the killing mode is the is the <laughs> and the chilling mode is mm. the actual to me power of the masculine and the the, the, the creating that culture that then makes sure that we're doing the right thing or more of the right thing than we do not the right thing mm -hmm. and and making sure that that those this dude energy is kept in check while it's doing all of these weird things in the world mm -hmm. that's where the balance to me comes from and i think that's a that's a that's an additional element and that's why the, the exactly like you're saying the work of of all of the networks that you're a part of is so absolutely crucial in in binding those ends mm -hmm. at, 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 to something so, that's fruitful. So we've come full circle to <laughs> the alchemical wedding, the <laughs> moon and the sun finally yes. coming into union, uh, the helocentric, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Helogenic, heliogenic, heliogenic yeah. civilization. Yeah. Wonderful, really nice yeah. to have this chat with you. And uh, like we we had so many chats over the last few yes. days, but um, I think we managed to somehow summarize it. Uh, I don't know what Adrian thinks about all this. <laughs> Was it interesting? Somewhat. Somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got to give you something to reach for, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you.